Hello, I'm William Tuvel. I cover North America for Press Gazette, and I'm joined today by Matthew Kaminsky, the Editor-in-Chief of Politico. Uh, do you prefer Matthew or Matt? Whatever you prefer. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Americans call me Matt, and uh, my European friends and my wife calls me Matthew, so... Uh, okay, okay. Um, so it'd be great if you could, we could just start, um, if you could give a brief introduction to yourself um, and, and to Politico and, and your involvement with Politico, which goes back a few years now, doesn't it? It does, yeah. So um, I'm, uh, I, was, I spent most of my career in, in legacy media. In fact, I started off with uh, some British publications, uh, uh, joined the FT out of, out of college. Um, as their stringer in Eastern Europe and really had a great run there and then was at the Wall Street Journal for what seemed like an eternity, mostly happy eternity, I would say. And then uh, about five years ago, Politico came along and said, hey, would you want to really uh, uh, turn things upside down a little bit, uh, take a bit of a risk um, and help us start a new publication in Europe because Politico decided, formed a joint venture in Europe with actual Springer, half-half uh, to, um, uh, create a new kind of publication based out of Brussels, but with a uh, uh, with operations from day one across European capitals, including London, where I'm happy to say we we have a uh, very successful and and a fast growing um, uh, um, team there. Um, I uh, got that off the ground, spent about three three and a half years in Brussels, and moved back here to take over my current job. Um and um. You say they they ask you to take a risk. I mean, I guess in a way, um, the Wall Street Journal is likely to be in in good in a good shape. I would have thought throughout the rest of your working life. So I guess that was a bit of a, a risk, well, going from um, a well-established brand to something that was a bit new and um, and and launching something in Europe as well. I mean, that's quite quite ambitious, I suppose, wasn't it? It was that certainly. I mean, I think just remembering back to late two thousand fourteen. Uh, when I was sort of considering this was you hear a lot of, you heard a lot of things like others have tried to, to create a pan European uh, media company, but that'll never work. There is no European polity. Therefore there, there's never going to be a European media. That's not possible. Robert Maxwell tried it. Wall Street Journal among others tried it. Uh, and, and it never kind of quite clicked as a business, nor really as a kind of compelling uh, editorial product just on that European space. Um, other thing we heard was it's really boring. Who the hell wants to you know write about the EU and and uh, and, and nothing ever happens in Europe in, anymore. And and uh, uh, why, why why would you even try? And the last thing is there's no business model for it. You know that um, what's the what's the market? It's uh, Europe is too fractured. It's too multilingual, um, you know, the, the nation states were the real action, which I think happens to be true. But what we discovered is Brussels needed something like this. Brussels is a hugely important place. And it didn't end up being all that boring. You know, we, um, we, uh, when we launched, we had a uh, Greek crisis, had a, had, a, had a Greek Euro crisis, a migration crisis. We had a bit of terrorism and we had Brexit. Um, so it's been, uh, you know, the uh, chaos is always a friend to uh, the, the news media, at least to our, to our journalism. And, uh, but, but as importantly, and, and even frankly, almost more gratifyingly, um, the business model worked in, in, in Europe. Um, people, um, there was a hunger for uh, coverage of the European political space that was, um, uh, authoritative uh, and engaging and deep and and fun uh, you know that wasn't boring um, there's also a, a professional need for really more granular information about what's happening in in the kind of Brussels quarters of power how is it related to what London is thinking to what Paris is thinking so we created a, a very um, healthy business uh, built half around subscriptions to we have a policy service called pro um, and, and half around more sort of advertising and events, but even the advertising was built not around kind of mass um, audience, but around having the right readers and being able to show that, you know, you're really driving the conversation among the people in power that, you know, if we could show, we always joke that in, um, 
that in Washington, our playbook, which is our anchor uh, morning newsletter, you know, has got around 200,000 plus um, subscribers now, read everywhere. But in fact, we only need, you know, one or two readers. You know, if, if, if Nancy Pelosi and Mitch McConnell on Capitol Hill read it every day, that's all we really need for this to be a, uh, a hugely influential uh, newsletter. And I can say with some certainty, although uh, that, 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 that is the, the sort of case. So the same model worked in sort of Europe too, that you were really kind of speaking to a small village, but a, but a small village of very interesting, very powerful people. Yeah. And then if you could sort of create something that they felt uh, attached to, then other people would want to read it. And then we could sort of also um, create a kind of strong business around that. Yeah. Um, so that was the risk. I mean, that, that was the risk. It's, it's always risky doing a startup too. I mean, it's, it's one of these things where, you know, there's also the risk of like utter embarrassment. You know, what if I just fall flat on my face? Uh, that, that would not be, because uh, you, you just don't know what, what's, what's going to come. Yeah. Fortunately, it worked out. Um, and just, just, I mean, it'd be great to know, um, I won't ask too much about, about Europe and I'll start asking about the future, but um, I'd be fascinated to know what it was like for Politico to, to witness Brexit from, um, from Brussels. And I'd be interested to know, presumably you um, came across the international and the, the UK coverage of it, but I'd be fascinated to just hear how your coverage you felt differed from, from UK international coverage and, and what, what you made of the whole the whole event really because i mean i guess it's still going on but um yeah must have been it's endless wait uh <laughs> because i think uh at least in britain you're sort of condemned to like live with europe it's uh it's never been more uh at least until covid was it was never as sort of uh such a big part of your public life uh, as uh, ever since you decided to to leave it um look for, for for us it was i remember early on um at our launch event i was asked a question you know are you going to be pro-european or anti-european and 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 uh, and the answer was was quite clear. We're neither pro nor anti. We don't have a we don't have a dog in this in this in this fight. If this thing becomes like a phoenix that rises to sort of you know to something incredible and great, uh, we'll document it. If it collapses before our eyes, we'll document it as well. And so we approached Brexit very much in that spirit. You know that. Um, we don't take sides in politics, not because we're more ethical or anything, but because we really have to make sure that both sides in any conflict have to rely on us and, um, and sort of read us and not feel like we're carrying the, sort of the water for, for one team or, or the other team. We really have no home team. Um, I think that was sort of a distinguishing um, uh, aspect of our coverage of the EU to begin with. You know, in, um, in Brussels itself, you had a uh, mostly pro-European, I, I would say, media. Um, I think the FT is openly pro, pro-European. Um, I mean, they would say their news coverage is, is just news coverage, but, you know, as an institution, they certainly support the European project. Uh, and then you had the kind of that strong cohort of kind of very sharply elbowed Euroskeptics, among whom Boris Johnson was, you know, sort of quite, quite prominent, you know, 25 years ago plus uh, when he was based there. So we were coming to this, I think, with a couple of, I would say, advantages. One, we were truly nonpartisan. We don't, if you want to vote to leave the EU, we'll write about it. We'll try and understand the dynamics behind it. We'll kind of, you know, trying to pull the curtain uh, back from what's going on at number 10, what's happening in uh, the EU offices, how panicked or happy or w whatever they these people are. Um, two, we came at it not just from no kind of uh, preconceived ideological position on Europe or on Britain's role in Europe. We don't have a national flag attached to us. I mean, we have two little flags, got the American flag and the German flags are two uh, joint venture partners, but our newsroom from day one, we were kind of, uh, I would say, post-national in sort of some ways. Uh, um, uh, we, uh, we created a newsroom that was kind of really a mirror to the world we were covering. So I think we even counted it up the day that we launched. We had at least uh, uh, 15 passports and 20-odd uh, languages and a staff of barely, barely 50 people. You know, so there was no one uh, national point of view that, that, was, that was sort of dominant. And, and the last thing is I... I think we were always took a pride in um, like what you read in Politico about Brexit is we are as sure as we can be is correct. 
that is that you know that we're not going to take shortcuts because we want to get that story first to make some sort of political point or to sort of you know win win readers on the newsstand you know that that we kind of very much relied on we're going to be the most we want to be the most authoritative um voice on this and because we had um more reporters in brussels by the time that brexit came around i would say time 50 which i would if you add up all the British bureaus in, in, in Brussels, it probably dwarfs that. Um, um, so, so we were, we could go deep both on the politics story, but also on the very narrow policy issues around trade, um, everything else in all those chapters, if, if, if you remember the chapters. And then the, other th and the last thing I would say is that we had a very strong London team by that time uh, uh, with, um, uh, Jack Blanchard joined soon after uh, Brexit to launch London Playbook, but then Tom McTague was one of our sort of pioneers. Kate Day is the editor in, in London. So we really were always trying to kind of match up people in London and Brussels. Hey, what are you hearing there? This is what we're hearing here. You know, so we could really bring both dimensions to our Brexit coverage. And I think we figured, you know, wow, this is pretty chaotic, but even as Britain is blowing up this bridge to Europe in, in, in a certain sense, maybe Politico can be the information bridge with the continent. And we really very early on said, ah, this is our opportunity to grow in the UK itself. We can kind of bring the comparative advantage we have on the EU story to try and make inroads in, in Britain itself and to um, really build a brand, um, uh, build an audience for Politico style of journalism. And, and that was sort of Brexit was kind of our opening to, to the UK. Yeah. Um, and uh, could you give us an idea of how, how much Politico has grown um, since, since you joined, I suppose, in terms of readers, subscribers, editorial staff, staff, or anything, anything you can say, really? And I suppose, specifically, it would be interesting to know any, any figures around, um, around the UK. I mean, you probably don't have those off the top of your head, but an idea of how, how big, how, how much you think you did um, get into the UK through that, through that. Entry. I mean, the bottom line is we've grown a lot and we've grown a lot across the board. Um, if you look at Politico globally, um, it just uh, when I joined in 2014, we had an office in Washington and we had an office in New York. Uh, and um, uh, I think we counted up the other day. We now have at least we don't call them bureaus because we don't, you know, sort of use the nomenclature of so sort of legacy media in that that way. But we have, we have offices and su substantial ones. You know, I would say, you know, from uh, Sacramento uh, through Illinois to DC, up through New York, Florida. We just opened up in Canada, um, where we have a four-person um, quote-unquote bureau up up there. You go across the uh, the European continent, obviously London. Paris, Brussels, Milan, sorry, Rome, uh, Berlin, Frankfurt. Uh, we have a little presence in sort of Warsaw in, indirectly through our partnership with Axel Springer. Uh, we have someone in Sydney. Um, so it's, uh, uh, I, I can't quite say yet the sun doesn't set on Politico, but I, you know, we can cover a lot more of the world. In terms of the, um, the business, it's, I, I think readership I guess coronavirus crisis has really skewed these numbers. I mean, we were, we've grown from in the U.S. being around, let's say, 25 uniques to our um, to our site here, uh, um, not counting the Apple News partnership, which is roughly that or a bit less than that per month. So we we hit 75 million uh, in 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 March. Uh, that said, we're not a traffic play. We really are about kind of quality of the audience and, and, and being kind of have a very kind of clear focus on who we're writing for and what it takes to win those various audiences. But there are various audiences now, whereas before we were so focused just in Washington and we're always going to be focused in Washington and really on owning the Washington story and owning the Washington conversation. But we now brought in the conversation around um, intersection of business and government. Uh, we've really built out in, Can in, in California. We're now moving into Canada. In terms of the European business, you know, we've gone, it's almost five times bigger, I would say, than, than when we uh, came into Europe. Uh, we had bought a small newspaper there from the Economist Group um, that uh, the, 
the European voice and then sort of uh, launched Politico off, off that. But it's been a, you know, by multiple factor growth. I would say in sort of London, you know, we, we started off with one reporter in, in, in London back in 2015. And I think we're probably looking at uh, an office now, at least a dozen, but there are more plans to expand. And, and um, as, as, you, as you may know, we really see um, political Europe really sees, political in Europe sees that sort of the UK is a, is a great growth opportunity. Mm. And those plans haven't been uh, uh, pushed back because of the Corona crisis. Okay. Um, have, how, I mean, how has um, the Corona crisis affected politically so far? I mean, fortunately, we've had, uh, we haven't been affected in terms of, uh, as far as we know, none of our staff have had it. Um, uh, and um, that's, that's a good news. Um, um, I think it's affected us. Look, it's like everyone on this planet. Uh, we've had to make um, jarring adjustments to how we work. We've had to um, accommodate you know, uh, people who have un different situations at home or small children. We had to really figure out how you use Zoom or Uber conferences to run a newsroom virtually. You know, um, uh, I, I, I think, um, and like a lot of people, I, I, I think we're sort of very gratified by all things considered how smoothly that has gone. You know, in the first week, there were little bits of kinks in our processes, and um, the editor here, Kerry Budoff Brown, sort of sat down over the weekend and said, "This is not going to work this way, but I'm going to figure out how it's going to work." And she basically put in place a slightly modified system of um, uh, slightly modified system. We sort of changed the way we do some of our meetings, who runs the meetings, um, but. It, but since then, it's been incredibly smoothly, and I and I dare say it's even been in some ways more smooth than than sometimes it is in the in the office. Um, you know, I, I think uh, Zoom makes it possible. I mean, one of the things that we've been struggling with at Politico, to be honest, because we started off as being so washed and focused, and we grew super fast, but we grew um, primarily by creating new. You know, when we started a subscription service, we created Pro as a kind of standalone, almost entity within the Politico newsroom. When we started uh, the magazine, that was kind of a standalone entity within Politico. States, ditto, you know. Uh, Europe is a separate venture, even a separate joint venture. So we, when I was looking around at Politico, when, when I took this job about a year ago was, man, we got so many resources here, but we kind of under leveraged a lot of them because we were so siloed. Um, and silos grow up in any organization and certainly any, any newsroom and periodically you have to look at like how do you, are some of these silos uh, um, helpful or are they more detrimental to getting you to where you want to go? And I think we felt these are pretty detrimental to us. You know, we really, one of our great comparative advantages was the depth of policy coverage and that was sort of living in this sort of world of sort of pro. How can we kind of use those reporters, use those editors, obviously to, um, make our subscription services as strong as possible, but also bring that wealth of knowledge and, and professional expert, you know, and just professionalism to our, to our, to our core site, to our main site. Uh, similarly, by the way, we're thinking about how do we take reporters who basically were contributing to a free site and use them to make our subscription offerings uh, stronger. Mm. Um, you know, the state's teams, uh, they were kind of working on, somewhat on their own. Uh, uh, they were serving audiences within the states and, and we were thinking, well, how do you, that's another area where we have a great advantage over many of our competitors. Like, there are not many publications who have 10 reporters in California. We do. Um, can we uh, show that off more? So what happened with Corona, it did, it did a couple things that are uh, particular to us, but there's one I think lesson for other companies too and other pu publications. What's particular to us is that it played to some of our less recognized strengths as a publication. As much as we're known for, you know, the kind of rough and tumble of sort of, of sort of retail politics or our great Congress coverage, suddenly it's like, wow, Politico's got 20 plus people who cover healthcare and are much more embedded in the Department of Health and Human Services 
and know a lot more and have a lot more people who've been kind of covering this for, for years than I would say any of our competitors. Uh, you know, the great newspapers in America and, and certainly is sort of the, the new digital outlets. And that was a great advantage early on. And then, you know, we have great policy reporting around economic policy. So, um, so when we were, uh, when Congress was thinking through the bailout uh, or the rescue plans, we suddenly had tons of people who knew tons about the Treasury, who had been covering the budget for years. We could really do accountability journalism and, and really provide the kind of added value content that others couldn't provide. Um, the other comparative advantage ended up being the states. You know, the, the, two, um, uh, the two hotbeds for, uh, for corona in America have been, start off in Washington State, then moved to California, which is a big story, and then obviously New York is the epicenter of the crisis in the, in the U.S. In California, we have around 10 people. In New York, we have about double that. So uh, suddenly we had, wow, we're sort of, we have, we can do, we, we can sort of break news, credibly break news, do kinds of features that others will end up copying uh, because we have these great, uh, uh, this great depth. And the last thing that I'll say is, is that it's, uh, and this is a lesson I think maybe will um, resonate for other publications and certainly companies. Um, this crisis has been, in some ways, a great leveler. It, it's, it's uh, you know, by working through Zoom, you can have the same conversation with your Congress editor as your California editor. And the fact that you're, the California editor is not um, out of sight, out of mind, as, as sometimes happens in, you know, and this is having worked in foreign bureaus for a lot of my career, I am, <laughs> I'm very sensitive to this, that suddenly, you know, the, the newsroom is everywhere. And everyone is equally part of the newsroom physically as much as sort of, uh, you know, on, on, on paper. Uh, Slack similarly has been a kind of great leveler that great ideas emerge from, from, from any, can, can emerge from any place and can really flow up to the top in Slack more easily than, you know, sometimes when you're in the same newsroom, you have a coffee with a colleague in the corner and, a, and, and, and that's where the idea comes from. And the fact that you're no longer physically in the same place is not a, uh, is, 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 doesn't, carries no disadvantages. Um, so um, I feel that's been uh, for our newsroom, uh, I wouldn't say re revolutionary, but quite revealing and, and, and in a very positive way that's really made us feel like a more integrated and a bigger publication than we may have felt even a couple of weeks ago. And I should add that our, um, the fact that we have so many wonderful colleagues in Europe, uh, that's added so much richness to this. This is a global story. Yeah. Uh, you know, the virus carries no passport. It just goes wherever it sort of wants to go. Um, and, 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 and trying to do it justice as a global story. Um, we've been able to do that in a way that we could never even dream about doing, let's say, well, certainly not five years ago, but even I would say three years ago, you know, this is really, I think that the publication is now big enough and mature enough to rise to the occasion in a, in a way that it couldn't have um, just a couple of years before when we were smaller and, 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 and organized differently. Yeah. Um, and it hasn't, from what you were saying, it hasn't affected Politico's long-term plans for expansion. You haven't had to make any cuts so far. We haven't made any cuts so far. Um, I, I think we are, as a lot of people, um, we are cautiously optimistic for Politico. Um, and uh, we reserve judgment on what longer term is gonna happen to the economy, uh, um, to the global economy, to the, to the American economy. But there are, uh, for our business, there are, you know, more than half our business is uh, long-term premium subscription contracts. That gives you a lot of stability and, and you can kind of plan ahead much more easily than advertising, which as you know, can go up and down uh, very easily. Uh, the second thing which gives us cautious, makes us cautiously optimistic is that our advertising business is not directly exposed to the hardest hit sectors. We don't have a lot of retail advertising. You know, we don't really have a kind of general interest consumer um, 
kinds of advertising. So we're not, the fact that, you know, the Hyatt hotel chain may be going through some troubles or, did, or so Delta is, is not going to be feeling as, as confident, doesn't directly affect us. Um, we've had to, obviously, we've, uh, this is going to have an impact on our events business, which is a part, a critical part of our, our business, but, but not a, in terms of n numerically is, is, is not uh, that big. We are trying to sort of pivot. Um, we've said we will not do in-person events uh, at least through the end of the summer. Um, and and uh, we don't know what that's going to look like longer term. But in the meantime, we are experimenting a lot with um, virtual events uh, as the rest of the world goes online. And a lot of the, these sort of in-person experiences will happen uh, via the computer. Um, so we've we had a very good first quarter um, and and we um, we are again hopeful that um, uh, we will hit we will know what we've hit what kind of bottom we've hit as an economy and, and then they can kind of look a little bit more soberly at sort of where where, where we are but so far uh, there are a lot of positive signs for um, uh, I wouldn't say I, I think again I don't want to sound Pollyanna issue the whole world is in a, in, a, in a health crisis and an economic crisis. Anytime you are thinking about the prospect of 20% plus unemployment, if not more, double digit GDP drops, every business is somehow going to be affected and we're going to be affected too. Um, uh, that said, I think the, our business model is, is resilient. Um, and, and I would say sort of longer term for us, um, you know, our publication revolves around covering centers of power, around understanding what government is up to and, 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 and sort of illuminating that, that sort of world of sort of political world. Uh, Washington, once again, is gonna be the center of attention in the US. The national capitals in Brussels are the centers of attention in Europe. There's a lot of money coming out of government uh, going forward. A lot of people who want to um, sway the decision makers of how that money should be spent, understand the dynamics. And that is a place where we think we do this as well, if not better, uh, I would say better than, than anyone else. Mm. Um, and how do you see the, the future? I mean, how do you see this, uh, this crisis affecting the journalism industry as a whole? What, what's going to emerge from it? Um, more politicos, um, fewer newspapers? <laughs> what, what's, what's the... Long there's only one political, William. Uh, there's, uh, there's no need for, for, for any more. Um, look, the crisis is obviously accelerating a lot of trends that were uh, um, sort of un underway, uh, uh, that, that were clear before. So the troubles that you're seeing with, with sort of local journalism, those have been aggravated by this. The, um, the decline in uh, print journalism and, and the viability of print has been really accelerated by, by this. Partly people um, don't go out to buy papers anymore. Um, partly it's because those papers are primarily sustained by um, advertising and, and that is, uh, that's just gonna drop. Anytime you have an economic drop this sharp, you're gonna have general advertising drop. Um, I think you will have, um, it'll expose weaknesses in business models and, and um, companies that over be reliant on more fickle sources of, of revenue are unfortunately going to, to suffer. Um, that said, people consume information now more than ever before. Uh, the need for reliable information is, is greater than ever before. Um, a lot of the really great old brands in American journalism, you know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, have pivoted quite have pivoted quite successfully to, you know, uh, passing the the cost of what they do from advertisers to subscribers, and and, and that's a very stable, you know, uh, uh, sort of bedrock for for them. So I, I think 
for better and for worse, you know, the sort of big, strong players are going to probably emerge strong. We'll have sort of short term, we'll see a short term impact on their bottom lines, but longer term will probably emerge stronger. Is that healthy for democracy? That's an interesting uh, question for the Columbia Journalism Review to, to sort of chew over. Um, How do you mean, sorry? And, and, and hmm? How do you mean, uh, sorry? That, you know, that, that whether you are going to have even that, that that's a sort of that, that, that a few media outlets are going to come out of this even stronger and are going to kind of continue to squeeze out, you know, more local players, the old Kansas City stars. And the, I'm not picking on the Kansas City star. I have no idea how, how they're doing. But, you know, that you will have less pluralism as such in, in, in the media. You know, some people think this is a bad thing for American democracy. I happen to think, you know, there is pluralism in the media. Everyone now has a, a publication platform. You can say what you want on Twitter. There's so many outlets and so many different sources of information that is probably, to my view, slightly overstated. Mm -hmm. And the last thing, I think kind of niche players like us, where we have a very kind of clear editorial mission and we have a very um, uh, clear focus on who we need to, um, uh, who we need to sort of bring in as sort of readers, and then a business model which is tied very clearly to that editorial mission, I, I think will, um, we should thrive. Uh, we'll all have to adjust, you know, this is the, the reality of some capitalism, you know, facts change, environments change, capitalism, Darwinism, whatever you want to call it, you know, it's, uh, you, you, you have to be also kind of smart about uh, pivoting, you know, if something's not working, you should try something else. Um, I do think this is an interesting time that um, to where I think a lot of publications, uh, certainly the more creative ones, are going to try a lot of new things and, and are going to be thinking a lot about how is the world around them changing? How is it, how is this sort of questioning kind of some of the first principles around what this publication was created to do uh, and adjusting to uh, or running experiments that, uh, that, that where you do adjust to, you know, the sort of cha changing world. The world's clearly changing very fast. So, so we have to change along with it. Mm. Okay. Well, I think that's probably everything I wanted to ask Matthew. So thank you very much for that. Uh, thank you. I stopped recording, hopefully that saves. Um, just a couple of things I just wanted to cover